restrict my ability to of because challenges that I face from having $33 worth of tapes, 40 cassette tapes, needing to pay rent, your wife is pregnant, you're going to have a kid, what are you going to do? That personal challenge, no employment, employment in Ward 8 is like over 50% 50 50 for black males, unemployment rate. So you hustle. But I wasn't going to hustle illicit material. I had intellectual property. This. I also partnered with Carnegie Mellon to make an album with. I created my own comic book character, the great deity Da. Said that's going to be my moniker. So I created my own narrative, wrote an album, EP, found ways to get into local studios, pressed that up at disc makers, found a distributor in New York, and later on in the story that would actually tie into Wu-Tang Clan, because I got into the indie circuit. And a few years ago, I realized that that project reached over 30 countries worldwide. I go to cities around the world and there are people that are like, we grew up on this record. We grew up on you. So, hustlenomics, way. You have intellectual property. You know there's a mass event. You package something, puts messages out, right? You merchandise that vision. I told you life and death. Well, here's a t-shirt from 23 years ago from that project. The saying, you get out there community to community, and you go out there. Now, things don't go your way. You always have challenges. Even now, the same skills I had then carry on till today. Because I've been going through a family crisis that's been difficult. But, and in fact, it almost affected me being able to speak here today. So yesterday... I had to redo my whole site, get the presentation to Allison on deadline, and deal with the crisis the way I've dealt with crisis all along. You think, and a lot of you are going to look where you're going to start your own company, you're going to work as a consultant, you're going to work for companies. What you bring is the extra value of how you manage when things go wrong. Everybody wants a fast answer of the rocket to the top. And I wanted to get into that personally before I tell you all these great stories of these people because you have to understand that personal challenges are a part of the game. But how you organize, how you manage, how you develop a process how you adapt to your situation, how you keep the ball moving and expand the vision so that now this challenge now becomes an opportunity to get into new areas because you have developed a new way of coping, of handling. So now you develop new products. I go with a tape to the Million Man March, but I eventually wind up creating vinyl and sending that out, which gets me into other markets. So the cassette tape was not what I wound up doing in the challenge of how am I going to feed my family. It became vinyl records, which has now allowed me to be in vinyl shops all over the world where there is a value on that market, where now I could now take what we're doing here and see if I could now establish points of sale in 30 different countries. So now a product that's being done in the Swartz Center of Entrepreneurship could be distributed to over 30 countries because of how I managed a challenge. And I'm still managing challenges today. You have to overcome. You have to understand the value. And, you, and that special sauce, that special innovation that you come out with is that hustlenomics. That's the hustle. Come up with a 
You deal with this environment. Wow, I don't have this. How am I going to do this? That stress and all of us have anxieties. The way you deal with that and what comes out of it is the way. That's the hustle-nomics way. So now, let me tell you about the story of P. Diddy. First of all, with P. Diddy, he went to Howard University. I interacted with P. Diddy in 1994. He was actually my very first interview for Owners Illustrated, but I didn't even know it. This is the Hustonomics way again, right? So I gave you my own background, but now I'm giving you my own background to how I told this story. So I had a bit in a business school there at Howard. I wanted to understand Bad Boy and P. Diddy. He was just building that at that time. So for a marketing project, I said I wanted to interview an old alum who was Diddy. He runs the city. So you know him now. There's Sean John Fashion. There's Revolt. But he started off as a party promoter, and things did not go his way. Um, actually, some people died at an event he did. He rebounds from that, mismanagement, things go wrong to, I know how to bring people together. So rather than just doing parties, why don't I bring the party vibe, what the DJs do? They're mixing music, they're bringing old school R&B, then the DJ will talk. Why don't I bring R&B music, classic R&B songs with hard edge street raps of the guys during the party? Why don't we combine those two? And the combination of those two developed the bad boy sound. The combination of those two allowed him to work on Mary J. Blige's project, which wasn't bad boy, it was Uptown. But on the project there, he was able to put Big E on a remix, which allows him to come up with a project Start Bad Boy with Biggie, Craig Mack, Big Mac. So he takes a McDonald concept, takes a mixtape. One side is Biggie, one side is Craig Mack, Big Mac, goes to a major urban event, puts it in a styrofoam, in a bun, you get a cassette, Big Mac. Right? Innovative, right? He didn't put any logos on it, though, because, you know, the McDonald Big Mac. So Big Mac. Now, this five songs, 10 songs in total, established the baseline of Bad Boy Records because he had these songs from Biggie, who's like nothing anybody ever heard. Then you have Craig Mack, who had been in the industry for a while. That allowed him to have humongous success that allowed him now to now merchandise. See, the thing about hip hop, the hustle-nomics way, when you go into these environments, and I have to just keep going back to that because I have to posit it, because now we're less interpersonal, more in the digital era, but then that's why monetization on a lot of these platforms are bad. Because all it does is silos you, but it doesn't allow you to understand that commerce still moves person to person. A like button does not equal finance moving. And I have to make that point to illustrate what hip hop does better than anybody else. Because there's a revolution coming. That would be when hip hop finally figures it out with tech. Nobody in Silicon Valley could compete with the hustlenomics way. Once this locks in, and that's where I'm at the baseline of. So... With hip hop, you go in the community, people have everything for sale. You're going to hustle to survive. So when you're a person that makes music based in that community, your mentality is everything's for sale. So you're not just a musician. I'm going to sell the clothes I'm wearing. Hustlenomics, hustlenomics. It's a registered mark too, but we'll talk about that later. So now... You see him with this aesthetic. He's wearing chinchillas, luxury cars. Hip hop created, basically generated 20% of the sales for Rolls Royce. I know because I've actually helped move a lot of Rolls Royces. I worked with a dealership in Atlanta. They sold out of their inventory. 
by partnering with us. The issue now is, well, how do people understand the dynamic of a person that says, OK, this way of wearing fashion, this type of cut is not what you're doing in Milan. It's not what you're doing in France, but it's what's going on in the urban community and it can resonate. So he creates Saint John, brings that to Macy's. That was a billion dollar company. Now he gets into beverage, still back to the original thing he was doing party promotion. He had a tragedy. He's still utilizing same principles from day one. Now, though, I'm a partner with the people that actually sell the beverages being consumed. Partners with Ciroc. But my compensation is going to be tied to how many cases I move. Because I know that when I bring my value to your company, I want a piece of the action. So now he's able to take, work with Diageo, Chirac brand, and move millions of cases of their vodka. That's not enough. I've spent tons of money getting my artists on radio, getting my artists on platforms. What if I own my own network? Fuse TV was a local network in New York that was up for sale. Few people were bidding for it. And he was like, well, Comcast was trying to do their merger. And it was like, well, we need more minority owners of media. He took that play. That became Revolt. He also so got into Revolt. And now that becomes a platform where he talks about culture. You have music. You have content. But he did something that was even bigger. A lot of events go on in New York City radio. You know, there's been even violence at the radio. You know, it's been like all this. It's like a real movie. But then there's also like new discoveries, new freestyles. So he revolutionized how radio is broadcast. Radio was an audio platform. He turned it into a visual platform. The Breakfast Club. We're going to videotape you guys in the morning. So now listening to the radio is not listening to the radio. Listening to the radio is watching the radio, which now creates the value in the industry of podcasting that makes Spotify now have to acquire podcast platforms. That wouldn't have been possible without hip hop, because if Diddy did not capture millions of viewers with The Breakfast Club, then where is the incentive? For Spotify to now say, no, we're not just music. We're music and podcasts. So we've hung out with Diddy. He was recording Last Train to Paris. Here's an autograph cover from a cover feature we did with Diddy. Um, good friends of ours, The Block, King Los. Um, he is also on TV, too, was an um, artist that we actually helped break. We were the first people. One thing with Owners Illustrated, too, is we broke a lot of artists. Mano got his first ad in the first issue of Owners. I actually created the ad. I actually went into the hood in Brooklyn, personally took the picture late night, and now people know Mano, but... The Mola did, he died, actually did his first ad, got it into the reprint of the first issue of Owners Illustrated. Which brings, so Diddy's now worth over 900 million, probably he's going to get to a billion. We started off our whole concept with who will be the first rap billionaire, and there are a number of rap personarios who are going to get there. Diddy, though, his father was a old time hustler who used to hustle with a number of people and familiar with a lot of people on the streets uptown New York. You go further uptown, you get to Westchester County. People think, okay, what's in Westchester County? Westchester County. That's White Plains, Yonkers, Mount Vernon. Well, in Yonkers, a lot was going on. 
And there was a crew called the Rough Riders. Didi had done some business with them, signed their group called the Locks. The anthem is Money, Power, Respect with Little Kim. Um, they had an artist, though, Dark Man X, DMX, who also brought dog culture. A lot of the cultures that go on in these environments are not foreign to larger American society as a whole, just that if it wasn't something negative going on in an environment, attention is not paid to it, but there's a lot of innovation and survival techniques that could be quantified. And I would love to actually do some research projects where you could actually take some of these lessons, some of these quantifications, do analysis, get funding, and then try to develop new algorithms that could be used for society as a whole based on the hustlenomics way. So Diddy signs them and he puts them on bad boy. Panero, Sheik Luch, Biggie talks about him. Unfortunately, Biggie dies. But they were still able to bring another American pastime, motorcycle culture. But people weren't aware that there was an urban motorcycle culture. We go to Urban Bike Week. So Rough Riders created their logo. You see the biking helmets. We actually worked with them, did features with a lot of Rough Riders. So their thing was, we're going to monopolize people's awareness of biking culture in the urban community. And we have artists that could tell the stories of the urban community and our marketing, our brand ambassadors are just urban bikers. So every urban biker wanted an R. You wanted to be affiliated with Rough Riders because you wanted to affiliate with Eve, Locks, Swiss Beats, Dragon, DMX. Urgh. Prior to Rough Riders, there was nobody that was able to amplify that. Also, at the head of the company was a woman, their sister. So you have two brothers and a sister. And I show this to show, so you see Swiss Beats with owners. It's wah, it's Rough Riders. Women, also, women have always had a leadership position in the culture. The very first hip hop record, Rapper's Delight, that was successful, was released by a woman. Rough Riders, the person handling a lot of the business, was their sister. And everybody knows about Swiss Beats. You hear his music, but he's gone beyond music. He's an art basil. Now he's gone to other cultures. He's affecting art. He's doing things. He's doing outreach with his wife, Alicia Keys. And Rough Riders will wind up doing movies, getting into the movies. Eve will wind up having her own TV show. Swiss Beats would do a lot, and they would generate hundreds of millions of dollars. Nine figure, wind up having a nine figure impact on the industry. Business impact, nine figures. And the last group we're gonna talk about today is Wu-Tang. Wu-Tang is, and here you see me, Raekwon, RZA, you got, they just had a 25th anniversary of Enter the Wu-Tang. And again, hustle nomics way. People talk about the five boroughs, but nobody was talking about Staten Island. They were like, oh, that's the bridge, Verrazano, who cares about Staten Island? Past Brooklyn, that's a damn near Jersey. I don't care. Staten Island. Even though there have been groups that had made their noise to force some D's prior, but nobody had respect. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm from Staten Island. UMCs came out. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm from Staten Island. Where are you from? It's like, shout out your name because call and response. Where are you from? Who do you identify with is a critical point. And now some of those techniques is also how people amplify on social media. A hashtag is really like what hip hop would do, which is call and response. 
So your hashtag is like a call and response. I'm getting into business impact of hip hop that's not been monetized. See, the key thing is that people don't appreciate the innovation of hip hop. People listen to the culture, but it's been yet posited that people take, okay, this is what the culture does. Here's how it relates to technology. Why do urban topics, why does a population that's only 14% of American population dominate social media platforms? Well, a lot of what generates attention on social media platforms is things that are derivative of hip hop culture. It's hustlenomics. So where are you from saying you're hood? I'm from Stapleton. That hashtag, that identifier, which unifies people who share a common place, a common idea, is now what, this is how you go viral on social media. However, stories, human stories, stories that people could connect with is still what actually sticks. You could go viral and then be done. But the story sticks, which is why you could have 25 years of people identifying with Wu-Tang. This group that would say, we're gonna have nine member band. We're not playing music. One of us makes the music. All of us speak. It's like nine vocalists. Who's ever done that? Then you're gonna to go to the record label and say, well, you would just have us as a collective. But us as individuals would have the right to take this brand and go make our own individual projects because it was like, how do you convince nine people to be in a band? Well, each one of you would get a chance to say your own piece. And that was very disruptive to business because record labels don't wanna build value in your intellectual property for you now to go to a competing record label to now take that value. But what they said is that no, what RZA had the ingenuity to see is that no, what we're going to have is multiple record labels building value in this intellectual property. And as multiple record labels build value, each individual project will flourish. That worked so good, you started having derivative Wu-Tangs. So it wasn't just the nine members anymore. We had Wu-Tang affiliates. It was like, yeah, this was a cousin. <laughs> this, this ghost face brother is a now that concept that was disruptive allows people to build alternative value in other products and that could also be carried on into other industries how do you convince people to say don't be territorial or just something like what Carnegie Mellon just did we're going to open up our education software and make it open source that was like an open source thing because it was like this logo would now be ubiquitous because it will be seen with multiple budgets. So it's not only your budget that's promoting your project, it's multiple budgets. Now multiple people could get access to this brand identity. So I just was talking about some of the disruption Multi-product, but he didn't only use that for the music. Now when multiple people are building the brands, how about WooWear? We're gonna bring it in the clothing industry now. Cause now I've gotten multiple record labels, multiple music corporations to promote this logo via millions of dollars. So taking these artists, he had a bigger vision. Hustlenomics way again, building his brand, using other things, because once you're aware of what the logo looks like, now you could place it on other products. So now they have retail. You're able to see that in video games. He gets into video games, Wu-Tang video game, Wu books. He's also bringing new cultures in too though. Everybody used to love those Kung Fu movies on Saturday. So what he did was, well, these are really, this, he started introducing the global world to indie Chinese movies.
by bringing audio clips from small independent movie producers and integrating them into music that is now marketed and distributed by multiple global music companies. That move now has endeared him to global audiences around the world so that now Wu-Tang is still one of the most popular logos. And then here's where it gets down to me. So when I said that there were affiliated Wu-Tang groups, these affiliated members were able to use the Wu-Tang brand and go to indie distributors and get access to record shops. These indie distributors that promoted Wu-Tang, I was able to go to. And like, what, what's the sound? What does it sound like? It's a little it's edgy like Wu. It's some Wu stuff, but it ain't Wu though. It's out of DC. Out of DC. Yeah, man, y'all know RZA? Nah, he messed with my man though. <laughs> Which is true. Raekwon's very close friend managed a very close partner of ours who produced the music with us. So we were Wu-Tang affiliated, which allows us now to get our product into the distribution channels that they created that was alternative. It didn't exist. Who are these indie vinyl shops? How are you getting into these indie vinyl shops? It's an underground culture. Because I couldn't get to BMG, Sony, MCA, Universe, none of, the, none of those were signed an independent artist out of DC. But Wu-Tang had created the underground circuit and not only them, Jay-Z was able to use that too. So he had Freeze Records, the very first 12 inch by Jay-Z that became the single for the video. Right? Ain't No on one side and Dead Presidents on the other was actually distributed by Freeze Records. The success of that allowed him to get the deal to distribute Reasonable Doubt. And now Jay Z's also on his way to being a billionaire. So these small, alternative, fragmented, Places of distribution, fragmented business models have actually amplified to billion dollar ventures. Yet, still overall, the story of how hasn't been maximized and understanding the underlying dynamics hasn't been posited till what I'm doing. So that was me telling you what Wu-Tang has done. Here I am with the RZA.